We're going to analyze some poems by John Donne and Christopher Marlowe. The text of these poems can be found separately in this week's module, but I've also copied and pasted them here so that you don't have to flip back and forth between windows. The first poem that you have is called A Valediction Forbidding Morning by John Donne, and you'll remember from our terminology unit that a valediction is a poem of farewell. So this poem is one in which the speaker is saying goodbye to his lady friend. We'll just call her his wife for now. Um, John Donne was one of the most famous poets in the Renaissance, and he's famous for something called a conceit. Conceit is C-O-N-C-E-I-T. And a conceit is like a symbol that's used throughout a poem uh, to mean something else. So the symbol is maintained all the way through the poem. And in both of the poems by John Donne that you have, you'll notice a conceit as we go through. So I'll point that out to you when we get there. Also remember that the poets during the Renaissance were interdisciplinary, so many of them had expertise in multiple areas of study. In addition to being a, a scholar of literature and a writer, John Donne was also well versed in the art of cartography or map making. So you're going to see a lot of references to map making as we go forward. So we're going to take this one stanza at a time. Dunn says, As virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go. So think about that. A virtuous man is a man who has lived well, and men who have lived well know that when they die, they will go to heaven. So a virtuous man will pass away mildly, quietly. He'll be certain of his fate. So he'll whisper to his soul and say, Go ahead. Um, and it says, while some of their sad friends say no, the breath goes now, and some say no. So it does say that some of their friends will be sad about it, but again, the virtuous man is not afraid to die. So Dunn says, as, the, as these good men die, and, and die calmly and confidently, let that be how you and I part. Let us melt and make no noise, no tear floods, nor sigh tempests move. So he says, just like they die with confidence, knowing how everything's going to turn out, that's how we should part. No crying, no sighing. Toward profanation of our joys to tell the laity of our love. So he says it would profane or dirty up how pure our love is to cheapen it with all this crying and, and scene making. He says, moving of the earth brings harms and fears. Men reckon what it did and meant. But trepidation of the spheres, though greater far, is innocent. So here he's saying, you know, people get scared about the planets moving and, and the earth rotating and stars and all this stuff. But really, it's just innocent. It's just time passing. There's no, nothing to fear with, uh, with the earth spinning around its axis. Don't worry that time is going to pass while we're apart. And then the next stanza, he's going to talk about sublunary lovers, and there he means physical lovers, so people whose relationship is purely physical. He says, dull sublunary lovers love whose soul is sense. So the soul, is, the, the soul of their love is their five senses, meaning touch. So those physical kinds of lovers whose soul is sense cannot admit absence because it removes those things which elemented it. So here he's saying, if all we had was a physical love, then that love couldn't stand absence. It couldn't stand being apart because that removes or takes away the very thing that created our love, which is the body. So he's saying our love is, is greater than that. We don't just have a physical love. He says, but we, by a love so much refined that ourselves know not what it is, enter assured of the mind, care less eyes, lips, and hands to miss. So because you and I know each other really well and we're inter assured of each other, we don't care about being apart, not being able to kiss or touch or see each other. Now he's going to talk about... Uh, the, their souls spreading apart. He says, Our two souls, therefore, which are one, though I must go, endure not yet a breach, but an expansion, like gold to airy thinness be. Now think about this for a second. He's saying our souls are really just one soul. That's how connected we are. So even though I have to leave, uh, it's not going to break us apart. It's actually going to make us bigger. Um, think about a nugget of gold here. And if you can picture a blacksmith hammering that gold, if he continues to beat it and hammer it, the gold will eventually just spread out and become a huge sheet of gold leaf paper. So he's saying that's how our love would be. It wouldn't break apart. It would just get bigger and bigger. Now he's going to use a conceit, which is a compass. And he's not talking about the kind of compass that points north, but the kind of compass you see here, a mathematical compass that has two feet and draws a perfect circle. 
So he says, if they be two, meaning their souls, if they be two souls, they are two so as stiff twin compasses are two. Thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth if the other do. So he says, your soul's like the, the foot of the compass in the middle of the circle, and your foot of the compass never moves unless the outer compass moves. So you'll move when I move. And though it in the center sit, yet when the other far doth roam, it leans and hearkens after it and grows erect as that comes home. So if you picture moving the outer foot of the compass further away, you can picture the inner foot leaning towards it. And if you picture moving the outer foot closer to the center, you can picture the inner foot getting straight again. And yes, the growing erect as that comes home is a reference to something. And he says, such wilt thou be to me, who must, like the other foot, obliquely run. Thy firmness makes my circle just and makes me end where I begun. So she is like the outer foot, uh, or sorry, she's like the inner foot that keeps him steady and helps him complete the perfect circle and come back to where he began. Dunn's next poem is called The Flea, and the whole poem here is a conceit. So the flea is used as a metaphor all the way through the poem. Now, John Dunn was kind of a dirty, dirty boy, so he wrote a lot of poems where he was trying to seduce a woman, and this is another one of those. So picture two people sitting next to each other, and there is a flea jumping back and forth between them. <clears throat> Dunn says, but this, mark but this flea, and mark in this, how little thou, that which thou deniest me is. It sucked me first, and now sucks thee, and in this flat flea our two bloods mingled be. So the flea bit him, and then it bit her, and now it has both of their blood mixed together inside of it. He says, thou knowest that this cannot be said a sin? nor shame, nor loss of maidenhood, right? So he says, this, this blood mixed together in the flea can't be wrong. We shouldn't be ashamed of it. It's not like you lost your virginity, right? Maidenhead is virginity. He says, yet this enjoys before it woo, and pampered swells with one blood made of two, and this, alas, is more than we would do. So Dunn here is trying to talk this woman into having sex with him. And he's saying, the flea got to enjoy our blood mixed together before marriage, and it got to swell with one blood made of two, and we wouldn't even go that far, so why won't you sleep with me? He goes on to say, oh, stay three lives and one flea spare. So he's saying all three of our lives are joined together in the flea, yours, mine, and the fleas, where we almost nay more than married are. So it's better than being married. Our blood is joined. This flea is you and I, and this our marriage bed and marriage temple is. Though parents grudge and you, we are met and cloistered in these living walls of jet. So even though our parents don't want us to be together and you're kind of holding back, we're already pretty much married because our blood's mixed together in this flea's body. So in the next stanza, he says, Cruel and sudden, hast thou since purpled thy nail and blood of innocence? So she kills the flea and he's acting offended. He says, wherein could this flea guilty be, except in that drop which it sucked from thee? Yet thou triumphst and says that thou find'st not thyself nor me the weaker now. Tis true, then learn how false fears be. Just so much honor when thou yields to me will waste, as this flea's death took life from thee. So he says, um, you know, don't, don't think that it's wrong for us to be together. Look, we killed the flea and it had all of our blood mixed in it and nothing bad happened, so we won't waste anything by sleeping together. So this is a very fancy proposition. Next, we're switching to Christopher Marlowe. Marlowe was a poet and playwright who was very close friends with Shakespeare, and many have suggested that Marlowe and Shakespeare may have shared or stolen from each other some material. This particular poem is what we call a... Um, a nature poem. Um, it's, it's, it's focused in nature and uh, it idealizes nature. Sometimes these poems are called pastoral poems. P-A-S-T-O-R-A-L. Pastoral poem. Pastoral poems are set in nature and they idealize it, meaning that they present it as being perfect. Like this is the perfect place for love. Uh, usually the stars of pastoral poems are shepherds, so they're guys who live outside all year round and everything they describe is perfect. The weather is always perfect. The flowers are always blooming. It's kind of unrealistic almost. All right, so let's look at this poem. Uh, this is uh, the shepherd calling out to his lover, Come live with me and be my love, and we will all the pleasures prove that hills and valleys, dale and field, and all the craggy mountains yield. So we're going to have all the pleasures of nature. 
There we will sit upon the rocks and see the shepherds feed their flocks by shallow rivers to whose fall the melodious birds sing madrigals. So we're going to sit and watch the shepherds work and watch the birds sing. There I will make thee beds of roses and a thousand fragrant posies, a cap of flowers and a kirtle embroidered all with leaves of myrtle. So I'm going to make you a bed and dresses and you're going to be beautiful and clothed in the, in the clothes of nature. He says, a gown made of the finest wool, which from our pretty lambs we pull, fair lined slippers for the cold with buckles of the purest gold, a belt of straw and ivy buds with coral clasps and amber studs. And if these pleasures may thee move, come live with me and be my love. So if any of this is tempting you, come on with me, girl, and be my love. Thy silver dishes for thy meat, as precious as the gods do eat, shall on an ivory table be prepared each day for thee and me. The shepherd swain shall dance and sing for thy delight each May morning. If these delights thy mind may move, then live with me and be my love. Okay, so this is your perfect example of a pastoral poem. He has completely idealized everything about nature, told her how perfect it's going to be, and yes, it's unrealistic, but again, all he really wants is for this woman to say yes. So again, this is your example of pastoral poetry. Finally, I gave you a little excerpt from a play by Christopher Marlowe, and this play is from, uh, this play is called Dr. Faustus, and in Dr. Faustus, Dr. Faustus is a philosopher who wants to know the secrets of, li of all life. So he gets to go uh, to the underworld, the, to basically to hell, and he gets to meet all of the famous people who have ever died and ask them, um, you know, what happened to you? What can you tell me about, uh, about the afterlife? Um, and uh, Dr. Faustus sees Helen of Troy, and Helen of Troy in, the, in ancient Greece was known to be the most beautiful woman to ever exist. And I gave you this passage really for one section, so let's just read the first half and we'll talk about it. It says, Was this the face that launched a thousand ships and burnt the topless towers of Ilium? Sweet Helen, make me immortal with a kiss. Her lips suck forth my soul, see where it flies. Come, Helen, come, give me my soul again. Okay, so here he's talking about Helen of Troy, and when Helen of Troy was kidnapped from her husband by Paris, uh, her husband basically started the Trojan War. He launched a thousand ships to go and get her back and burnt down Ilium. Um, and so when Faustus sees Helen, he says, <clears throat> is that her face? Is that the woman who started the war? Now notice he says, um, Come, Helen, give me my soul again. So he wants to kiss her because she's stolen her, his soul from out of his mouth. Now, I want you to notice these lines from Romeo and Juliet that Shakespeare wrote. That Ju Juliet and Romeo have just kissed. And Romeo says, um, my lips by yours, my sin is purged. So by kissing, Romeo says to Juliet, oh, you've, you've purged me or, or forgiven me for my sins. And Juliet says, oh, no then have my lips the sin that they have took? So Juliet says, well, did I just take on your sin in my lips? And Romeo says, sin from your lips? Oh, trespass sweetly urged, give me my sin again. So he says, kiss me again and give me my sin back. See, he says, give me my sin again. And look how similar that is to come give me my soul again that Helen says. So this is one of those examples of how Shakespeare and Marlowe were maybe just borrowing some lines from each other. So you're welcome to read the rest of this, but I really just gave it to you so you could see those similarities. I hope you've enjoyed your first Renaissance poetry. Let me know if you need any help.